Today I want to talk to you about being worthy of riches. Worthy of riches. Sometimes it's easy as a Christian to believe that God wants to bless your neighbor or the person sitting next to you, but you just aren't certain he wants to bless you. Well, I want to, I want to get rid of that today, all right? I want to help you in your thought capacity. So I'd like to thank you all for tuning in around the world to the broadcast. And I believe this message today, as simplistic as it may seem, has the power to change the course of your life. It has the power to change the financial area of your life. It has the power to change the, the uh, inheritance of the next generation of your family. You know, the Bible talks about, and Drop said earlier, some fell by the wayside, some fell in stony ground and soil, and but some fell into good soil. And that good soil produces not always at a hundredfold capacity, but it does produce. Sometimes when the economy is bad, hey, if you're getting just a few percent, that's better than being negative nine, right? So celebrate that. I remember we went through some troubling economy, and as I was balancing out portfolios, we call it drawdown. So I was looking at the average drawdown of my colleagues, and you know what? It was two and three times what our drawdown was. The reason being is we have a principle we used, say a truth. Principle is a truth. Do you know you can operate on a principle that is a lying precept, and it will also produce, but it produces negative right? It produces sub-level, sub-par. So there's two things that I got to get to you. Number one is faith. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. It's not the substance of things you've cried about because you lost them. It's about the hoping things of life. And so when a believer gets to this hoping segment in their heart, what happens is the brain begins to conceive new thoughts and ideas. It starts seeing another outcome, right? So faith is the substance, the matter that things are created from that you're hoping for. It's what the Bible definition is. Some say, well, faith is an expectation. Well, faith is a this and faith is... No, let's take the Bible definition. Now faith is... The substance of things. What is the things? There is no conclusion to the things. The things are as you desire. Right? As you're hoping for. So everybody's hope is different. Everybody's hope is unique to them. Right? So faith is the substance that literally begins to fabricate what you're hoping for. Now, it's just as easy to hope and get failure as it is to hope and get success. Because believe it or not, fear operates very similar on a line as faith does. Fear, though, starts, it's a substance that creates those things that you're hoping for. But you know what? That's defiled faith. Let's say that. Fear is a defiled faith. It works very similarly, if you will. It goes to produce. And, and fear must be fed. Put that in your notes. Fear must be fed. And a lot of people don't understand this, that they can feed their fears. How do you feed your fears? What you watch, what you hear, what you, what you listen to, right? What you meditate on, and more importantly, what you speak out your mouth. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, the Bible says. There's another precept for our success, guarding what we speak. You guard what you speak because you guard what you meditate on and you guard what you put in your heart. So fear as a seed goes into the soil also and produces. But its production is something we usually don't desire. When it materializes and manifests, you really don't like the outcomes. Now, full-blown matured fear is death. Some people are afraid to live. Why? Because it comes with responsibility. Isn't that amazing? So we see that these two things work. Um, and both of them tie back to our subject today, which is you being worthy of God's riches. Both of those. A lot of people cannot move into this next verse. Keep it right where you're at, Tim. They can't move into this because fear rules and regulates their heart and mind and not Bible-defined faith. 
It all comes back down to that. See, you can have faith and not know the law of seed time and harvest, and your faith will be dormant and inoperative. You may say, oh, I believe. Oh, really? You believed and got saved, but have you done things beyond that? Oh, no, salvation is the sum total. Salvation is the sum total of your eternal resting place. Right? It's not the sum total of how you'll live here on earth. It took care of where you're going to spend eternity. And if you turned it off there, you're denying yourself many benefits that came with that salvation. It's kind of like this. Um, the Hublins went out and bought this really nice car. And if God's telling you to speak, and he's speaking and saying, give that to the Goodmans, that's a blessing. Just keep the payment. Keep the payment. Right? No, watch this. Watch. If you would have gone out and bought this car loaded, because when God sends a blessing, it's loaded. When God sent salvation, it was loaded with many precious benefits. But the one that is most recognized in the life, in the death, in the resurrection of Christ is salvation. But when you look at salvation, a biblical definition of salvation, it's all burden removed, all sickness and disease removed, a total new being is you in that creation. A new specimen, right? In salvation, some don't even want to agree with this, but in salvation, the word peace has an element of prosperity. It is well with you. What did the word shalom mean? I hope you walk out and go bankrupt. No, it meant God be with you. God peace with you. God's abundance with you. God's prosperity upon you. It was a salutation of great benefit. Enormous covenant blessing upon you. But we resolve it to just salvation. Now salvation is very, very important. Don't get me wrong and misquote me. It is extremely important. But now, back to that car. Can you imagine it has GPS? Can you imagine it has automatic uh, uh, door locking mechanism whenever you, get a, you, you turn the car on, the doors lock so you don't you know, fall out? I hear Diana drives very fast, so going around a corner, Peter don't fall out the other side. Right? So that's a benefit, right? They were telling me that it automatically starts and, and it regulates the climate inside the car for them before they get to it. That's a benefit. Right? We call it options. The GPS can talk to you. Mine's trained. When I get in, it says, Mr. Goodman, you look well today. Mr. Goodman, ooh la la. I'm like, yes, I love you. I love you. So he goes, Mr. Goodman, I do you too. No. But watch, you got GPS. It talks to you. It can dial things up. It can help you find a restaurant. It has all of these incredible benefits just in the GPS option. The heated and cooled seats. Your bum will be warmed when it needs to and cooled and refreshed in the summertime. That's the perfect bun climate change whatever. Right? Amen. So you have freezy buns and toasty buns. That's a benefit. So the people that don't read the owner's manual don't always receive all the benefits of the option in the package that came on the vehicle. They're only concerned about if I start it, I get from point A to point B. Kind of like salvation. If I receive Jesus, I get from point A to point B, missing point C called hell. But what about all the other benefits that came with that selection? Are we going to even explore them? Are we going to look at them and see that God has wrapped them into the life and sacrifice and resurrection of His dear Son, Jesus Christ? For our benefit, not detriment. Do you see? But for us to extract the other benefits that come in the package and the options in package, you know, it's optional. Watch this. It's optional to utilize the, the window switch so the windows go up and down. It's optional. If you don't mess with them, they'll either be up or they'll be down. It's optional to you. Now, they exist, but you got to take action to press the button. And you got to know where that button is and how it functions. Or, you know what, when you want it up, it's down. And when it's down, you want it up. So you got to learn what's the manual for to teach you how to utilize the options. What's God's word for? To teach us how to utilize the many benefits through the life of Christ. Think about that. 
Now, we're ready for Proverbs 10, 22. The blessings, baraqua, which means prosperity, pool of prosperity that's present. Not something that's going to come in the future. Not something that was in your past. But this is present benefit that is here and now. A pool of prosperity. That's available. But see, if you didn't read the manual and don't understand what the, this word blessing means, then you don't understand it's present. It's ever with you. It's in the package. It's in the car you bought. It's one of the options. But you got to know how to push the right button. Does that make sense? Peter, as, as you know, God created Peter in a nice package, super-sized package, right? When God said champion, he said Peter. He, he's head and shoulders above everybody. He's a champion. So watch this. If Peter didn't know that there's an option that he could literally save his seat arrangement, he'll always be with his knees up around his ears trying to drive. He could go through four or five years of ownership and go, this is the worst car I've ever had. The seat will never adjust to me. Read the manual. Push the button. Get the benefit. There you go. Tweet that. Read the manual. Push the button. Get the benefit. It's that simple. We make it too hard sometimes. Do you realize God really wants to bless you? God really wants to help you? God's not bringing harm on you? He's not trying to take you out before your time? He's trying to keep you to living like fine wine because He's put so much in you. Amen? So Proverbs, the blessing of the Lord makes rich. He didn't say some. It's an affirmed statement in context. The blessing of the Lord makes rich. One rich. Look at that. Makes one. I bet the blessing Lord has to do double time to try to help the person be rich. Think about that. Maybe we're fighting and contesting the benefit of God that's trying to make us rich or the grace of God. You ever hear, oh, don't frustrate the grace of God. They use that for sinning. But what about trying to make the blessing rich of God impoverished? That's frustration. Can you imagine if your natural father or mother kept trying to get you to use the credit card and you're just like, oh no, oh no, won't do it. Oh, please. Right? So the blessing of the Lord, as the text says, makes one rich or makes rich. It makes rich. It didn't say makes impoverished. It didn't say makes subtraction. It says makes rich. Now, notice it didn't say in salvation. If so, all the religious legalistics would went, oh, shouldn't I? Didn't say that. It didn't say that. It didn't categorize it just to spiritual things. It, it, it puts it in a blanket statement for all things. All. So let's read it again. The blessing of the Lord makes rich. Look at that. And He adds no sorrow to it. So in this blessing of the Lord, there's no negative. In this blessing of the Lord, there's no retraction. In this blessing of the Lord, there's no evil. In this blessing of the Lord, there's no wickedness. In this blessing of the Lord, it's pure. It's precious from God Himself through the life of Christ to you and I. It's pure. The word rich there is ashar, which means to accumulate, to grow rich, to become, to make self-rich, to make kings. When God's blessing is on you, when you walk in God's covenant, He makes you kingly. A king without credit doesn't have a crown. But the king with the crown has plenty of credit in the land. Does that make sense? Think about that. You could be the poorest of poor king, and if you've got a gold crown, just chip some off and pay for it as you go. Right? Prepaid card. Right there. So what we're trying to see is, how do we get blessed? Does God want to bless us? Are we worthy of the blessing? And all of this coming through Jesus Christ, I've got to ask, are you worthy 
of the blood of Jesus Christ to remit your sin? Some people can't answer that. But the ones that do, they experience salvation and all its many benefits. Does that make sense? Look at this. It mentions multiple blessings of the Lord. Salvation plus, 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 plus. I don't understand this. How can the super spiritual, religious, legalistic mind love salvation, right? And, and make it so important. We've got to be saved. But yet, we forget all the many pluses. And then when you want to explore those pluses, oh, no, 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 can't do that. No, 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 no. It's just for you to get to heaven. Think about that. Because then that's saying that these two words of blessings, which is plural, not blessing, it's blessings, and rich, which is all-encompassing, are misnomers. Just a thought. Watch this. It makes you rich, I like this, in all areas. He's not just talking spiritually. It's all inclusive, spirit, soul, and body. It's all inclusive wealth, well-being. I like this. It says the Lord will add no sorrow with it. So that means sorrow, you know what? He just chose to not put it in the blend. It's not in the mix. You know, when I blend a portfolio, depending on the client, sometimes I don't put like high tech, you know, high revenue, small caps or micro cap stocks in there. You know why? It doesn't need to be in their blend. It's not suited for them. So let me give you this insight. God, with all of his infinite wisdom, looked at the life and embodiment of Christ and all the supreme sacrifice that would be given and went, you know what? He bore their sorrow, so I don't need to add it into the covenant doesn't need to be in the blend. It's not beneficial for them. You don't need to crawl to Christ. You need to walk to Christ and receive Him. Think about that. Do you know, if you really look at God and understand His character, before you even take the step, you've already been received. He's just waiting for you to initiate. Do you hear me? He's just waiting for initiation. While you were yet in your sin, He what? Hated you? Some people's Bible, they interpret it that way. No, He loved you. While you were yet still in your sin, He loved you and gave His life for us all. Imagine that. That's the character of God revealed. So with this blessing, with this covenant, with this supernatural grace, there is no sorrow in the mix. None. So where do you pick up sorrow? I want to know. Where, where did sorrow come along? Didn't come from heaven. It, oh, come on now. If I'm going to bake you a cake, you know what? I have a list of ingredients. I don't need to just grab Coca-Cola and throw it in the mix. It's not on the recipe. Have you ever gone, if I go grocery shopping with you and I'm having one of those munchy moments, we're going to walk out with things we certainly don't need. Right? I remember many times shopping with Drop and I start grabbing. She's like, what are you doing? So we have a rule in the Goodman household. We never go shopping when we're hungry. Because you know what? I don't go to the fruit and vegetable section. I'm still not renewed in that area. I got other aisles I really like to canter down. Trust me. And if I had no restraint called the shot collar, I mean drop, watch. I would have multiple baskets. I would link them together. I'd create the Darren Sweet Freight Train. Trust me, it'd be stuck together in baskets, have trolleys. I would have them linked together and all be filled with, with Hostess cupcakes, with these uh, Pop-Tarts. I would have a little bit of everything in there, just in case. Amply supplied. Never know. When you have a sweet tooth, you never know what it's going to call out for. So just have it all in the cupboard. You know, she's this, she's this impoverished shopper. She, when we used to buy m and she'd just buy the little bag. I'm like, heck no, get that king size thing. We're prosperity people. We'll never eat them. Oh, I'm going to try. <laughs> right? Watch this. What God gives man is always pure and for his benefit. It's always pure. 
Oh, if the God, if God gave me the gifts of the Holy Spirit, I don't know if I could trust myself. Trust me. Every gift comes down from the Father of lights. Every good gift. So when God gives you spiritual gifts, it's because He's trusting you to develop responsibility, maturity for your benefit. Put this in your notes. God is the supplier and giver of all blessings. You get around some people because of their belief system, because of their style of religion, um, they will think that God also gives you curses. They will think that also God, you know, uh, attributes good and evil upon you. And it's all God's will. It's not so. You can't find Scripture to back that up. Then they always point out the book of need a job, Job. Right? But they don't ever give you the last couple chapters of the book. The only, the only, it's kind of like, you know, have you ever seen some of the way they do these, these um, shows? They, they, they just build it and build it and build it, especially like the mystery detective type show. They'll show you literally 45 minutes of bad, evil, wicked to set it up for five minutes of breakthrough and they get the murderer. I've always tell drop. I just started telling her, I know what's going to happen in the end. Some of them get very predictable. It's always the neighbor. It's always the friend. She's always sleeping with the guy. Then somebody finds out, so he's got to kill him. Or she's got to kill him. Then, then it's a, a fight between the two wives. It's a cat fight, right? The man's wife and her best friend that took her man. That's how it works. And they always have a life insurance policy to set the stage good. Something. It's just crazy. Right? But people think that along with God, he also has this element of wickedness and bad. God's going to get you. I remember one day I just looked at my grandmother. I said, I wish he would. I wish he would get me. Because I knew God is good. So that means it's better than my present. Right? If God gets me, ooh la la, we're going to have fun. Right? But in her mind, in her heart of hearts, God could also do wicked and evil. It's not so. None of that is revealed in God's character. Look at this. Philippians 4.19. Is this good so far for you? I'm trying to stay in one spot to help all of you out. I want to just run around here. I, I'm serious. I want to get those shoes like with springs on them so I can just hop. Wouldn't that be fun? Philippians 4.19. And my God. Look how personal that is. You know, you can't receive all of God's benefits until you make Him your God. Then you know. You know, it's one thing for me to see a check that has your name on it. It's another thing to see my name on it. Does that make sense? So you got to start seeing God's promise and blessing with your name on it. With it assigned and ordered to you. And when you do, you will have what the Word says you can have. Right? And my God shall supply Look at this word, all. Sometimes we, when we declare, we limit God working on the behalf of someone else. We don't want to say all, we put maybe. So if you have that problem, you know what? Just start changing it to all. When you pray for somebody, all. God is going to do all. And this is what was being declared to the Philippians. He's saying, my God in whom I believe. Look at this. Shall. I mean, He will supply all your needs. Not some of them. Not part of them. Not the ones that He favors. All of them is what they're being taught. How did we as Americans ever change that? Dear Lord. I love the people. Oh, if you ever take away from the Bible... If you ever add to it, he's going to add to your part in a lake of fire. Well, what do you subtract from it, you little religious heathen? Right? What words are you subtracting because you're not putting it in proper context and believing God is a good God? Think about that. 
My goodness, they're gonna, they may end up surprised one day. They get there thinking they were little God Junior, God Cop. And he goes, excuse me? You never even knew who I was. You told everybody I didn't want to bless them. You told them that I was mean and evil. I only wanted to bless some and not all of them. You lied. Lake fire. <laughs> I mean, think about it. So let us never subtract from God's Word. Let us amplify the Word if we do anything of how great and gracious God is, how merciful and loving He is, how, how His mercy goes to many generations. Yeah, it's always fresh and new every day, the Word says. So here we see, He shall supply all your need according to His riches and not your riches. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So God's supply is not based on my limitation. Sometimes we get moving with our faith and we start understanding how faith can work in natural things. And then we hit a plateau where, uh-oh, I don't know if I can believe for that. Why? Well, I, I just don't know. You hit your limitation. You hit the border. And it's time to blow the border out. It's time to blow the border out. Amen? Amen? Because when you blow the border out, now all of a sudden you go from your developed limitation, your border, to all of a sudden something beyond. We're another realm of all things are possible if you can believe. And it's not wrong to have borders. It's not, not wrong to have guideposts. It's not. Those are breadcrumbs that allow you to track your steps so if you get off path, you can come back to center. Does that make sense? It's not wrong to have borders so that you can function to full capacity. But know this, God is not limited based on your limitations. We limit God based on we limit our faith in God. And God's ready to blow your borders out. Amen? So right here, and my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. This word right here, according, means this is how He does it. Do you see that? So the, the writer saying, okay, here's how he does it. Through Christ Jesus. I've never found a gospel other than the prosperity gospel. Because everything God does for man is through Jesus Christ. As he blesses him, the word blessing means to prosper. If it means removing sin and applying righteousness, that's prospering. Right? So it's all prosperity to us. And all of it is dependent upon the gospel. Because without the gospel, none of it is relevant. None of it. Amen? Without the gospel, salvation isn't available. Without the gospel, the peace Jesus said, I leave with you. Not of this world do I leave this peace. It's heavenly peace. That's not even possible without the gospel. So all of our life and livelihood as Christians is advanced, is benefiting is graced is success uh, uh, succeeded with and prospered by the gospel of jesus christ so when you hear people say oh that's the prosperity gospel yeah you know i don't like the bankrupt gospel don't like that one that means jesus didn't come up out of the abyss the 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 bankrupt you know the non-prosperity gospel means jesus didn't take the keys that, that non-prosperity gospel means Jesus didn't let captive free. They're still held up. Getting their Amanda, what is it? Amanda rights? Miranda rights. So we don't like that gospel. The prosperity gospel is pretty good. You know what I have found? I found true men and women of God understand God's blessing and prosperity. They don't misuse it. They know how to utilize their faith to benefit things in the earth, and not only themselves, but others around them. Most of the people that are getting the bad rap, if you'd get to see their financials, are some of the best givers in the community. So I don't know any other gospel than a prosperity gospel, because if there's any other gospel, it means man is still bankrupt. Man still has an immense debt. Man will spend eternity in hell, because the gospel that I read that came through Jesus Christ and His shed blood and given body and resurrected state is one that prospers man. To a place of sinful nature, 
to righteousness in Christ. It's crazy to me, right? Even the ones that purport that on radio have to believe God to pay the bill at the end of the month. So where'd that increase come from? You mean to tell me you're preaching a prosperity gospel? Let's move on. Look at this. So God is the supplier of all that we need. Jesus was appointed the distribution center of all God's blessing into the earth. All the covenant blessings come through the distribution of Jesus Christ. Amen? What would Costco's be without Federal Express? UPS or some of the other trucks. What would they be? An empty place of distribution. Think about that. Psalms 23, look at 1 through 3. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Pre Jesus going to the cross. Here's, here's a man that became a king, and he understood that God had to lead him and cultivate and care for him just as a shepherd does sheep. The reason being, he was a tender of his father's sheep. It was the clearest view, uh, focal point of his history, of his schooling, if you will, to see a relationship that would be altogether pure and beneficial was the tending of sheep. David understood that. You notice he also was a minstrel and he didn't say, the Lord is my musician. He said, shepherd. Isn't that amazing? David was a minstrel. He played for Saul. He soothed Saul's troubled heart. He didn't say, the Lord is my Sammy Hagar. That's too bad. That's the book I'm going to write. Right? He didn't say that. He didn't say, the Lord is my MP3. Because you could, the point I'm making is, in David being a, being a young man like any other young man, he was a minstrel, a musician, loved music, so he understood how to put music together and how that works, right? But he draws this analogy from tending his father's sheep. So he understood the resp responsibility of a shepherd. He understood how to care for his father's sheep. And it became the direct uh, analogy of who God the Father was and who he was. Think about that. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. I'm glad that the pastures you're walking in with God are green. Aren't you? Aren't they beautiful? Sometimes in the hustle and buses, we just forget how beautiful it is to walk with God. We just forget about how beautiful the journey can be. I've had to force my attention at this time of year always to look up and look at the leaves turning colors. In the spring, I've had to force my attention to look at the, the, the flowers as they bloom and bud. In, in my front yard, I got all kinds of flowers, all different colors of roses. I have so many roses, they're not even a, you know, a special thing at the Goodman household. That's good, right? It's cheaper that way. I always ask her up, you want a long stem rose? No. Oh, well, I can get you one real fast, right out the front door, right? You want it pink, yellow, what do you want it in? But think about this. Sometimes we get so caught up in everyday living, we forget to see the beauty of God all around us. We think we lived in a parched land whenever we're living in a land where it's flowing with milk and honey. A green, plush land. See, I, knew, I remember what life was like without Jesus. It wasn't so plush. Sometimes when people talk about their yesteryear, it's like it was freaking Disneyland or the Wild Adventure. Instead of, it was parched. It was dreary. It had no meaning. Walk with God and the beauty of what He created will radiate. He leads me beside still waters, not roaring rapids. I've been around some Christians and their whole life is a roaring rapid. 
It's like, won't you want to go with? No, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't need a life jacket and I'm not getting in your boat. I'm not here for the roaring rapid ride today. Got plenty of roller coasters in my own that I'm resolving. Don't need to get on your wild rapid ride. It's a wild adventure. That's right. And you can go it alone without the good ones. Right? He restores my soul. Look at that. As a shepherd, he restores my soul. What does that mean to a sheep? It means there's a point in time I'm so cared for by the shepherd, I can lay down, rest and still my mind, and be regenerated, rejuvenated by rest. He restores my soul. Those things that get fragmented in your heart, God pulls them all back together. Those disappointments that are trying to bust up your heart like a piece of a puzzle, He puts it all back together. This is how beautiful it is to walk with God. Is that not increase? Is that not prosperity? Is that not being successful? Yes, it is. A troubled heart sometimes is the biggest debt you'll ever owe. It is. And I know the value of peace. I know the value of sleeping and not, not worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow. I know that if tonight is my last night on the planet, it's all good. Amen? He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. See, the shepherd creates a flock, which usually represents a breed. And dependent upon how good he is at managing that breed and that bloodline determines the value of his sheep at market. If his breed and bloodline goes bad, watch. His name's bad in the marketplace. God is so concerned about His brand, He will not allow His brand to be bad in the marketplace. I want to just go home and cry right now. It's so beautiful to me. The greatest poems I've ever read were right there in Psalms. Watch this. I've never met a shepherd that was harmful to his sheep. God is ready to care for all of your needs. Out on the, on the uh, west side and kind of northwest from here, and certain times of the year you'll see shepherds out there and they'll have their, their little um, trailer, little portable trailer. And they're living right among their sheep so that they can care for them straightway and immediately. I've never, if they didn't care for their sheep, they would not be there. If they didn't care for the sheep, they wouldn't fix a fence that's movable so they can guide them in what pastures to eat in and when. If they didn't care for their sheep, they would run wild. But the true shepherd cares for the sheep. God cares for his sheep. He cares for you. He will see to it that you're well nurtured and, and have plenty to eat and drink on. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. David's saying, I have a perfect shepherd. And as an understanding shepherd, I'm always watered. I'm always fed. I'm always groomed. I'm always ready for market. The good shepherd will groom you for the great benefits of success. Oh, if God would bless me with that, I don't know if I could handle it. Sister, it's okay. Don't worry. God will groom you to be able to handle that future success. God will never put more on you than you can bear. We always think of that in the bad connotation, but it must be also true for the good. God's preparing a future for me that is beyond my comprehension. And I trust God so much because He's a good tender of the sheep that he will not rest it upon me until I'm ready and I'm getting ready. Psalm 68, 6. God settles the solitarity in a home. He leads out the prisoners to prosperity. If Jesus set captive free, that means He took prisoners and set them free. This correlates with that, and it says, 
This God we serve takes prisoners and transitions them to prosperity. We were all imprisoned with our sin. We were all imprisoned because we didn't have the right relationship with God. And all of that is removed because Jesus chose to set the captive free. What did he release us into? A prosperity, which means a life where all things are good. All things are prepared appropriately. Are you getting some out of this? But the rebellious, look at this. Here's the plumb line. But the rebellious dwell in a parched land. Several weeks ago, I taught a, a, a sermon, a message that was, we create our future events, whether they're good or bad. We want to blame things. We want to blame everybody. But at the end of the day, we had a decision. Our choice releases us into a place of power. We can choose to go a certain way or we can choose to go a wrong way. And right here, it's very clear. God does all good, but the rebellious heart produces what parched land they'll live in. The character of God is to free, to lead, to prosper. It's our rebellious behaviors that destroy our lands. It's our rebellious behavior. You know, there's this big movement about, oh, if we all repent, God will heal our land because of this truth that's in the Word. That's true. But prayer is not enough. Behavior change must follow prayer. Does that make sense? Healing is available for the land. It talks about when, when men and women come together and the righteous pray, they bring about much. Well, the reason they bring about much is because they pray and obey. Does that make sense? And as you pray and obey, it ushers in and brings in the goodness of God into the home, into the land, into a region. But now watch. It requires a behavioral change. Can I present something to you? You can't repent for sin you didn't create. Well, the Bible says, you know, Jesus said those that you retain are retained. Yes, but we take it way out of context that we're going to cleanse our land because we're repenting for the sins of a forefather. He's going to pay the price on his own shoulders and head. Does that make sense? But, 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 yeah, I know it sells a lot of prayer, uh, prayer books and it sells a lot of CDs on prayer and, and it helps sell tickets to prayer conventions. But at the end of the day, watch this, as I pray and obey God's word and allow it to direct and change my behavior, I will be healed, my family will be healed, the land around me will be healed, my business will be healed, everything that's associated to me will be healed. Does that make sense? Can you take just a little bit more? Look at this. 2 Peter 1, verse 3. His divine power. What is that? Grace. His divine power. It would be just as fitting to say, Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit has granted. His grace has granted. His covenant of Christ has granted. See, all these are applicable because they come back to God and His grace. His endowment of power and energy and strength. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain, not some, all, to life and godliness. All things. Oh, you can't live righteous. Oh, yeah, you can. If you understand His divine power, His grace. Do you understand that He's already declared you righteous? But I said, no, He's already declared you righteous. 
So walk in what he's declared you. Believe what he's declared you to be. Speak over yourself what he's declared you to be. But, but if I sin, yeah, but if, and that's why the blood of Jesus Christ knows no time boundary. It was just as powerful back in the day when he shed it as it is remitting sin today. It was a past, present, and a futuristic remitting of sin. Now, I could probably fill a church if I would teach it differently. Make people believe they're so wretched, they would probably just bust these doors down. Because that would be their meal ticket to get out. But that's not what the Scripture depicts. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Watch this. Here's the conduit again, as we saw in previous Scripture. Through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence. The, the purpose of the local church is to have knowledge. Knowledge of, God, of Christ. How God operates, the character of God, and then to exemplify it in a community. We've made it so many other things than that. It based boiled down, that's what we're called to do, is share and spread the knowledge of Christ. And notice when we came into this knowledge, notice the text message that's calling you higher. Called up to His glory and in His excellence. Imagine that. When Jesus or God called you to salvation, He just didn't keep you baseline. He raised you up. He elevated you above. He set you in a precious place. God's divine power granted to us all things. So let us not limit Him. Life and godliness was granted to us through Jesus Christ. Let's just receive Him. The unlocking key is God's knowledge or the knowledge of Christ. That unlocks all the covenant. The more you study Jesus, the more you know God. Put this in your notes. The more we understand Jesus, we will understand the character of God our Father. There are some religions that don't teach the preeminence and the, the deity of Jesus Christ. They will never understand the magnitude of God the Father until they recognize the deity of the Son. Because there's a very known factor here. He, he comes in the life and embodiment of the Son. And it is God among us, God in the flesh. But see, there's God also in the Father. There's God also in the Son. And there's God left with us through Holy Spirit. And we have to take that, that trichotomy, that, that three-part uh, embodiment of that Spirit of God and embrace each element of it. And that makes up the working of that new covenant. 2 Corinthians 8-9 For you know the grace... The charis, the graciousness, acceptable, the benefit, the favor gift, the joy, the pleasure, and thanks of our Lord Jesus Christ. Through, though he was rich, look at this, for your sakes he became poor, in order that you may be made rich through his poverty. That's the great exchange I always talk about. See, many. Bible teachers will teach that Jesus was impoverished. Jesus was impoverished in accordance to how wealthy he was in heaven. In heaven, all of heaven walks on streets of gold. The gate to heaven is a big pearl. The water sea in heaven is crystal. The foundations of heaven are jasper and all bedlam and all these precious elements. I would imagine heaven gleams and glows and radiates just off of the precious raw material that it's made up out of, let alone God's glory in the middle of it. So Jesus had all of this. This would be like you living in the Federal Reserve right by the printing presses. And then you choose to go work at Burger King. In comparison, you were rich and became poor. 
Does that make sense? The same was with Jesus. He was very rich, amply supplied in heaven where his residence is. Right? Comes into earth. Well, earth and heaven, there's a big divide right there. We would all agree. Right? Heaven better than earth. Earth good, but heaven best. Right? So right there, he lowered himself. Then he comes embodiment of man. So he limits God, all power, all knowing, all this attribute of God. He limits it into the embodiment and ability of man, Jesus. God's still in there, but limited through the created carnate, the flesh of man. That man suit was Jesus. Look at what Jesus did just on that level. Incredible. Right? Watch this. As we understand Jesus and His function in the earth, giving us examples and was teaching us of the kingdom He came from and that He represented, He didn't just leave it there as, I'm way up here, and you guys are all down here in pecking order. No. He took us up with Him and set us in heavenly places. Where? In Christ, far above it. All wickedness, all evil, all manner of darkness. So he didn't leave man just limited in man's state. He provided a way where we could be enveloped in him and set at the right hand of the Father. Thank you, Jesus. And this is why we are made rich. See, all the poverty assigned to you and I was born at that cross. And all the riches that were ascribed to Him, He exchanged for you and I. Though He was rich, for you and I's sake, He became poor. In order that you may become rich through His poverty. So if he bore your sin, do you want to go back out and create more of it? So if he bore your poverty, do you want to live in it? Not if you don't have to. Pretty good, isn't it? 2 Corinthians 9.8. We are almost done. Watch this. 2 Corinthians 9.8. And God is able. Say God is able. When man is not able, God is able. When you're not able, God is able. And God is able to make. If He's got to go and fabricate it, He will to uphold His covenant and His name. Remember, all this is about the name of God not being defamed. Does that make sense? And God is able to make all grace. So there's got to be all types of grace or a big portion allotment of grace. And He's able to make all grace abound towards you. He's able to do it. But if you don't believe He will, He won't. But if you assign and ask, He will. Ask of the Father anything in My name, Jesus said, and He will do it. God, make all grace abound to Darren Goodman. God, make all grace abound to me in this area. God, this business idea, make all grace abound to me in this area. If you ask, you shall receive. Right? Right? If you seek, you will what? Find. If you knock, it will be open. These are the precepts that Jesus, God Himself, tried to teach us through the life of Jesus while He was on the earth. Amen? So He'll make all grace abound to you. So seek, knock, and ask concerning grace, and it leapfrogs to you. Amen? I don't know about this. You ever, you ever wear... Um, there's certain materials, especially black, and you can walk like through a clothing store or like shopping and you get in close proximity of other materials. All of a sudden you walk in like, where did I gather all this lint? What happened? It stuck to you. You can actually take lint. You know, if you rub your clothes, you create friction. What happens? You get lint. It just jumps to you. You ever see that where it just kind of sticks to you? Well, this is what grace can do. You start rubbing up against the Word. You start rubbing up with God. You start to understand some things. You start calling things that be not as though they were. All of a sudden, things start sticking to you. The good stuff. Amen? 
Put the limb brush away, baby. This came to me by God. Sham! Bam! Isn't that nice? This is how it is. If there be any law of uh, reciprocity, if there be any law of attraction, let this be the greatest of all laws. Seed, time, and harvest, and it shall never cease. So as I'm seeding my relationship with God, I start harvesting in the earth. He called this the rule and reign in. Does that make sense? Things start leaping frog to you. If all grace abounds to me, that means, hey, when I walk through a place, I am amply charged with the Word. It should force out things to come to me. Does that make sense? That supernatural energy, energy wrapped up in grace that we never talk about. That supernatural uh, ability that releases inside this thing called grace. All of a sudden, it pulls things to me. I need health. It pulls it into my body. I need salvation. It pulls it into my salvation. The remitting of sin. Whatever I need peace in my mind, it pulls peace into my faculties. Grace is there as an endowment granted by the Father for us to benefit in this world from. Do you hear me? There's things we don't know. Grace can bring us to a place where knowledge gravitates to us. Relational relationships. You don't have the business partner, but grace will pull him out or her out to seek you and find you. Sometimes you don't have because you didn't send your CV abroad. Hello! It's an amazing thing. When the name is in the wind, what that grace will make that name bring to you. This is why it's so important that you got to speak and declare. you got to speak it into the air, the atmosphere. People think you're an absolute fool. That's all right. Not every fool knows how to board an airplane. That's why there's Amtrak. Hello. Hello. That's all right. But for you... I call those things that be not as though they were according to the covenant I have in God. I walk in His divine power and grace. All things seek me out to bless me. Like Peter, I step on a boat and the fish are going to another region. I let down my mat that the grace of God in me with Christ on my ship, ship, the, the fish come to my ship and my boat, filling my nets. Do you hear me? But what about the economy? I can live amply supplied in a horrible economy because the grace of God in me brings me the riches I need. It says that. It makes one rich, not impoverished. Matter of fact, let me, I, you know, this is a bold statement, but I'm going to make it. It's almost near impossible for a believer to live impoverished. It is. If you walk with the precepts of God, I sow, therefore I reap. I work, therefore I harvest. The Bible says, as I work, I'm blessed by the sweat of my own brow. This is the way it works. This is the way it works. It's another amazing thing. People can have revenue, but if they don't understand how to control their spending habits, you want increase in your life? Get rid of debt before you go back into it again. <laughs> I'm serious. So many times, because we are not subduing our flesh and our des wrongful desire, right? Carnality. Then we pay a price. But flip that over and say, okay, if I am amply supplied, abundantly supplied, and God's grace is working through my life, commanding the elements of my covenant into my life, then I can give attention to that. As I give attention to that, that gets amplified. Can I help you? You can't fix the people that are texting you. You can't. Command number 11. What makes you think you have to answer and respond? Nothing. Since when did you since when do we get committed just because we have a cell phone? It's like sometimes that thing's buzzing, let it buzz. Put it away and keep peace in your heart and mind. Does that make sense? Watch this. Most of their problems they didn't create in this moment. They spent a lifetime developing them, so you don't need to solve it in a moment. Yeah. That was a freebie. Look at this. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. 
an abundance. I know what it's like to not have an abundance. I know what it's like to have an abundance. I know what it's like to believe your way out. I know what it's like to make the tough adjustments and it's like here a little, there a little. You know, it's not real exciting when you save pennies. But it gets real exciting when you save hundreds. It gets more exciting when you save thousands. It gets more when it's ten thousands and tens of thousands. Then things start to get real exciting. Do you hear me? God's grace fills the space so you can run the race. Put that in your notes. God's grace fills the space so you can run the race. Sometimes you're just looking at what you don't have. Oh, this is empty. My life is so empty. I hear that from people all the time. My life is just so empty. I'm like, would you just hang out with me? I'll fill it up. I'll keep you so busy, you don't have the time to think about it. It's empty. My life has just become so empty. Let grace fill that space so you can run your race. I know what it's like to be hated by many and liked by few. <laughs> I understand that. There's a point in my life, it flipped over and I went, well, some will, some won't, so what? It's okay. They'll really like me when we all get to heaven, right? Yeah, I'm going to wear a name badge in heaven. Good man. Yeah. You know, when I go to the pearl gates, it's going to say, well done now. Good man and faithful servant. Put this in your notes, William, right here. God wants you to succeed. The supernatural power found in grace will help you accomplish everything. Everything. Sometimes we make grace so churchy, she don't even want to show up. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. Grace is an endowment of God's favor, God's supernatural power to help you Walk in His covenant. Remain in the covenant. And call out those benefits of the covenant to attach to you. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. 